So um, welcome everyone. This is the, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our awards for this, uh, for 2020. The, uh, the first award I'm gonna talk about is the Stormwater Professional Excellence Award. And um, actually I'm looking, that's right, I think we're on, I think we're delayed with feed loop. So I'm gonna keep going. So this, this award is uh, for an individual who uh, has demonstrated outstanding profession, uh, performance, professionalism and contributions to the stormwater profession. Uh, you have to be a PNCWA member and, um, and the, uh, the areas that uh, we're looking for um, are listed here, stormwater design management, watershed management, green infrastructure, contributions that have been beneficial to the nominee's facility and unusual initiative or performance beyond the call of duty. Next slide. And the award this year went to Marcia Davis out of the city of Spokane. Uh, she's a principal engineer and um, I've listed some of her key accomplishments over the last uh, decade or so. She was the technical lead for the 2014 integrated clean water plan and the 2013 CSO plan amendment. She has led the innovative one water projects that established Spokane's reputation as a leader in GSI. And um, um, some of these projects included the uh, West Central neighborhood stormwater retrofit and the Sharp Avenue permeable pavement project. Next slide. So moving on to the innovative stormwater project award. This award recognizes and encourages projects that showcase innovative stormwater elements. The projects have to be complete and functioning um, and they um, have to be completed by PNCWA members and they um, can uh, feature one of the one or more of the following components, stormwater design innovation, urban habitat enhancement, water quality enhancement, public education and outreach about stormwater, integration and enhancement of social, economic, and environmental factors. So anyway, congratulations to our, our award winners. And I wanna encourage everyone on the call to consider nominating professionals for the first award and projects for the second award. And um, if that's, um, there'll be official emails going out, letting people know when they can sub not submit nominees for that. Uh, you can always reach out to me in advance and let you let me know that you have a project so we can start working on getting that submitted. So next slide. So I'm very pleased that uh, our award winner for the, uh, the project this year, we're gonna have a presentation on that today. This is the Whispering Furs Stormwater Park. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a little confused here. <laughs> so here's the winner for um, Innovative project award. It's the Whispering for a Stormwater Park in Kitsap County. And uh, the key accomplishments of this project, it treats runoff from at least 113 acres of roadway and residential neighborhood. This will be growing in the future. Provides both treatment and peak flow reduction, um, recreational and wildlife amenities, and it improves the water quality in Clear Creek and Dyes Inlet. So it really checks all the boxes. So, um, we're lucky, go on to the next slide, to actually learn more about this project. Um, we have the project team here presenting, or at least some of the project team. It includes uh, two folks from, um, from Kitsap County, Michelle Perdue, who's the stormwater program manager, and Tim Beachy, who's the capital improvements project manager. And then uh, other team members that are presenting today are Jens Swenson, who's a landscape architect with Parametrics, and Norm Olson, who's the president of NL Olson and Associates. So I'm gonna hand off to the team to make their presentation and I will come back uh, for questions and answers. So take it away. Next slide. Thank you so much, Scott. And good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Perdue and I'm the Stormwater Program Manager for Kitsap County, Washington. I'm very pleased to be here and I want to thank the PNCWA for recognizing this project and inviting us here to share its story with all of you. Kitsap County is a county of over 270,000 people with roughly 250 miles of shoreline in western Washington. 
As you can see there, we're located on a peninsula surrounded by two critical water bodies, Hood Canal on one side and Puget Sound on the other. Kitsap is also relatively unique in that the majority of our drinking water comes from rainwater. So our stormwater program focuses very heavily on ensuring that we manage that runoff in the most effective way possible. Next slide, please. The Clear Creek watershed in central Kitsap County is located in our most populous area. And you can see it right there in the center of your screen. It's the big brown area. Um, the community of Silverdale and much of its surrounding development feeds into Clear Creek, which is a salmon bearing stream and eventually flows to Dyes Inlet and out to Puget Sound. Over a decade ago, the county determined that the Clear Creek watershed was a really good target for retrofit and restoration. Next slide, please. Kitsap utilizes our capital projects as well as our local partnerships to achieve the goals of our stormwater program, and that's to prevent pollution, reduce flooding, and enhance fish habitat. We found that the most effective way to do that is to focus our efforts on a watershed-wide basis. So these projects have included a wide variety of interventions, as you can see, from fish barrier culvert removals to floodplain restorations to the creation of regional treatment facilities. Run the first video, please. These projects work together to address the effects of development on the natural processes of Clear Creek, from the headwaters all the way to the estuary. The Whispering Firs stormwater park that we're talking about today is the latest in that suite of projects in the Clear Creek watershed. Thanks, Michelle, and congratulations to Marcia Davis. Uh, I've seen some of your presentations at other conferences and have, have really enjoyed them, so congratulations. Um, so my name is Tim Beachy. I was a project manager for Whispering Furs. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of history on the project and then um, some of the criteria that we gave the design team as we moved in um, towards completion. Um, so the history, back in um, 2014, the uh, stormwater group saw a 10-acre parcel that, or, I'm sorry, a five acre parcel that was available within the um, Clear Creek Basin. And uh, next slide, please. And um, they wondered if this could be utilized for a, a water quality facility. So the team or uh, Stormwater hired Anna Olson to uh, do a feasibility study to see if it's even possible to, to get stormwater to this site. And the short answer was yes. It looked like over 100 acres of untreated water could be uh, directed to this site and there was room for a water quality uh, device or, or some kind of system. And the initial idea was to have a, a large wet pond on the order of 25 acre feet. So this is, a, this is a big, big item. So in 2015, the county purchased the parcel and also applied for and received a grant from Ecology for $1.5 million. In 2016, I was brought on, on as project manager and I was just hot off the, uh, the project to the lower left, the Manchester Stormwater Park. And um, it was a good time for the team to sit down and ask the questions about what was the purpose of the project, what were the goals, and would we consider a more signature project, something unique. So we started design in 2016, and then as you can see, uh, completed construction in 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some of the goals that we gave the team, because we didn't know what we were going to do with this site exactly, we just knew it wasn't necessarily going to be a large wet pond. The first one was um, ecology grants um, require that you use technologies that are, have already been approved. Um, the other was that the grant required that we meet basic treatment for the basin that was um, coming to this facility. So as the team decided we wanted to maximize water quality benefits, and set the goal for treating to the enhanced level um, for the, the basin, and the team was able to do that. Um, we also wanted to create a multifunctional park, not just to treat the water, but to provide for outreach opportunities and for the community to actually use it. Then we decided to, to put the squeeze on the design team, and we said, hey, those whispering first at the front of the parcel, don't touch them. Um, and you'd see from some of the videos and the pictures that the, the drive actually goes between the trees. Um, then we said, there's this upper plateau, um, maximize that space up on top. Um, 
We also wanted the ability to isolate each of the treatment cells uh, hydraulically uh, during any time of the year for maintenance or for whatever uh, purposes that we needed. And that all these surfaces uh, that were accessible by humans need to be also be accessible by heavy maintenance vehicles. And we had a whole lot more. The one takeaway that I would give to uh, the attendees is that um, my, my hope when I, I brought up the idea of maybe doing a signature park, another one, was that our experience at Manchester would make this one easy. What I learned was that um, if you're doing a unique project, it is indeed that, it is unique. So the only advantage that the team had um, was that we had done it before. And um, Jens had been involved in Manchester, Norm had been involved in, in, in Manchester, so we had experience. But um, if it's unique, it indeed is that, and all the work is still there. So I will turn it over to the smart folks, uh, Norm and Jens, for more details. Next slide. Yes, hi, my name is Norm Olson with NL Olson and Associates. And uh, we were hired as the consultant, engineering consultant to, uh, to help assist design this, this park and, uh, and Jens with parametrics uh, we worked with us as well. So you've seen some pictures of the park. This, uh, this is a simple uh, site plan sketch. Um, the, uh, the park site, the, the parcel is uh, 5.3 acres and the developed area is uh, about 4.1 acres, including the future expansion area that's over there on the right um, that's, that sits well above in grade above the, the, uh, the park itself, above the retaining walls and, and, the, and the slope grade. That's uh, designed for 80% um, impervious in the future for whatever, um, you know, whatever might want to be uh, placed there. So inside the park, the, uh, the grade is at 176. You're gonna hear me say that quite a bit in this, um, and uh, 176 elevation. But we have two detention ponds, but they're connected with a large culvert. So they're really acting as one pond. They're uh, to, de to uh, develop this site, you know, we would need um, stormwater control and, uh, um, and, and, we did, and we did that with, uh, we would need 0.5 acre feet um, to develop the site, but we have well over that at one acre feet um, to serve some uh, of the upflow uh, the upflow upstream basin as well. Now we have the four filter media cells. They're uh, combined with a total surface area of 7,600 square feet. And we'll talk a lot about those. The area of the large uh, fir trees, the whispering firs are over there on the, on the left between the road. And then we have a park entrance and some parking. And uh, that area um, couldn't get into the cells. So we have some standard bioretention cells to treat that. So next slide, please. So design elements for stormwater for a, for a stormwater park such as this. Um, first, the, uh, we have a, the water quality treatment uh, flow, which is 6.7 uh, uh, CFS. Um, we, we need to uh, bypass the high flow. And uh, we, uh, so we have the conveyance. We decided to put the conveyance through the park instead of down the roadway because uh, because the park was being constructed. It was a was a better way to do it. It's a large, it's a large pipe that conveyance. Um, then the, the treatment uh, conveyance method, we, uh, we use uh, uh, head pressure to drive the flow um, through the park to the treatment cells and to the ponds. Flow splitting um, is important to, uh, to ensure we get to, to we ensure we get the, uh, the proper flow to all the locations. And so we, uh, with that, we have adjustable control and we'll talk about that as well. Overflow is obviously is very important and uh, we have redundant overflow throughout. Um, and when you're designing a stormwater park um, and with, with filter media cells like this, um, base flow is, you must address that. You know, that's the relentless uh, groundwater that, uh, that somehow gets into your storm system and, and just keeps on flowing even in the summer. If you uh, if you don't address that, you would just you might just uh, saturate all your all your media cells and they wouldn't work properly. So um, on this project, luckily we uh, we don't have base flow to worry about. We have in the past. Infiltration is is uh, 
control is very important. This site would be perfect for infiltration if you were just designing um, the site itself. And, uh, but, uh, you know, bringing over a hundred acres or um, into uh, the site or flow from a hundred acres, we, uh, um, we need to know, understand what's going to happen. And uh, this, this sandy site, it has groundwater that's down at 20 feet based on our piezometer readings during the uh, summer and down at uh, 15 feet at the high, high groundwater periods. And, you know, the, uh, but just down the hill from this is an apartment uh, complex where water pops out of the, of the uh, parking lot all the time, even in the summer and there's water in the crawl space. So we've lined the, uh, the water, um, the, the, the cells and the ponds to ensure we didn't cause any more problems down there. Maintenance, uh, Tim, um, he was adamant about uh, wanting to be able to have our adjustable controls um, available to turn off cells if needed. So we have, uh, and, and I can show you that, um, but our control is adjustable so we can, um, we can take a cell offline. And then minimum requirements, requirements, minimum requirements. The, uh, this is a site development. So just like any site development, private, public, the, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that we meet the, the code requirements and we have. So next slide, please. So backwater analysis and flow splitting strategy for this site. The, uh, as I said, it's, uh, um, we use pressure flow. If you look at the plan view up on top, there's a, the blue line just represents one route to uh, um, through flow splitters and to just one of the cells. So we can talk about that. The uh, up in the, the beginning up in the upper left is, is our high flow bypass splitter. And we set that at an elevation of 182. So I said that the park grade is at 176, so that's six feet above. So that gives us our driving head to push the water through the park. And uh, so if we look now at the, uh, the, the profile, again, the uh, starting left to right, we got our flow splitter. Then we have our, our uh, pretreatment with uh, the outlet from the pretreatment is at uh, 177. And then our part grade again is a 176, but our hydraulic grade line is a uh, max hydraulic grade line at max water creek water quality flow is at 176.6. So it's above the part grade. Um, so we have uh, our pressure pipe is it's HDPE, it's large diameter. So we reduce the friction loss um, so we can um, add, keep that hydraulic grade line as low as possible. So as we Continue down the profile, we have the uh, uh, future connection location where we can add another 60 acres or better um, to the park since now the uh, flow um, has increased the allowable flow to the media cells. Then we come to a, a flow splitter where these are submerged flow splitters, um, sending water two different directions. Then the next flow splitter is just two of those and uh, their uh, um, weir control, uh, they're, adjust they're adjustable and uh, they're the, the, uh, the uh, control that allows us to take a, a, um, a cell offline. What happens as, as the water at max flow is flowing over those weirs, it's, it's I think the, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, um, elevation is uh, 176.4, so it's, so it's above the park grade. And then if you add in the friction loss, that's where we get to that max HDL of 176.6. Um, but this, this, these weirs are hydraulically uh, disconnected. So there's a drop um, to 175.7 at max flow. That allows us to, uh, to keep uh, the cells, um, all of them isolated away from each other. And you know, if you were gonna design different types, if, if you didn't have exactly the same cell at every, then at every location, then, then having this drop would allow you some flexibility. But then as we continue on, um, another, some more flow splitters, and then we, we push the water up into the cells. So next, next slide, please. So just a couple of the splitter manholes. The, the one on the left is one of the submerged type splitters. Then the one on the right is the, uh, is the adjustable weir control and uh, the, uh, where the water surface is above the grade. We put the tops of the manholes at uh, 18 inches above grade for uh, to allow um, benches. And Yins was told us what elevation for that. Next slide. Okay, so the I it can, I think um, we're losing a little bit of our um, view on this, but 
it'll, it'll be all right. So um, the, uh, the filter cells, there's four of them. They're, uh, they're the same. They're, uh, each one of them has 12 uh, spillways into, uh, you know, so inlets into it. The water's pushed up from the underneath from our pressure pipe into these. And uh, at no point does any, any uh, travel path from the spillway travel more than uh, 10 feet. Um, once the water is treated by flowing down through the media, um, the uh, it gets into the under drain and then out to the uh, out to the ponds. So uh, next slide, please. So the uh, because of the shallow, uh, I mean because we are using pressure flow, we can keep these things very shallow. Um, the, uh, you can stand on the grate, you can, uh, you, there's no hazard for kids um, as far as uh, falling into something. Had we used a gravity, a traditional gravity type system flow um, into the park, our park is flat, it's 176. So we start, and if we had slopes on the pipes and the water's flowing downhill, then uh, by the time we get to the treatment cells, they, they'd be deep, they'd be you know, gaping holes in the and uh, they'd have to be fenced. So if it was a park, mom would bring the kids to the park and look into the fence and the kid would say, well, what animal is hiding down in the grass? They think it was a zoo. So the, if you look at the, uh, just more, a little bit more on the channels, the, uh, because these things are made of concrete, we didn't expect the contractor to, uh, to be able to um, build these and have exact um, height on the, on the weirs. So we put in HDB plate um, that, and so they could be adjusted. And uh, we adjusted it at the testing period and those weirs um, won't probably need to be adjusted again. So next slide. So as far as um, mass loading for the, uh, for the life of, uh, of the media, we just, I just wanna to touch on this quickly. I think I'm running out of time. So um, the uh, TSS, if we make some assumptions the uh, we can kind of guess on what the media life would be uh, and uh, or or contact or filter is going to tell us but the mean concentration in ts or uh, total suspended solids and stormwater if we assume that's 50 parts per million milligrams per liter based on some you know work gary metton did in his and rick wrote in his book um and we assume a pre-treatment efficiency of 50 percent that could be higher or lower we assume 25% of the TSS is trapped in the mulch and then removed from the site so it doesn't get into the media. And then we, we assume that 10% of the TSS is actually um, biodegradable material and it can be taken up by the plants and the microbes that are planted in, or that are in the media. And then the max loading of 24 pounds per square foot of surface area, that's based on some uh, um, work that uh, New Jersey did and, and it, it seems like that makes sense based on the voids, how much is uh, removed of the voids. With that, uh, a 20 years of life for this project of the media, or, or maybe even up, you know, with, depending on the assumptions, maybe up to 30. But if we were to uh, um, reduce the size of the cells by, by the higher rates that are allowed these days, 175, then, then the uh, life uh, the cell, the amount of cells is would be reduced, but also the life would be reduced. So that's a choice that folks would have to make. So next cell, our next cell, <laughs> next slide. Um, so Yin's our landscape architect. Um, he's gonna he's gonna go through uh, um, what he his design. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, it was a great experience working on the previous project at Manchester. <clears throat> so Jason and I, Jason Seraldi and I at uh, Parametrics were delighted to join the team again and, and work on this project together. Uh, we came in a little bit later on the project after some of the preliminary design was done. And um, we, um, as landscape architects, were asked to do two main things. One was to design the planting part of the water treatment facility, and two um, was to help make it a multifunctional park. And um, <clears throat> for the planting portion of it, the cells require a mulch on top, a three inch mulch. You may have seen it in Norm's slide. 
that is part of the treatment train. And the intention there is that that mulch will capture some of the pollutants and be able to be removed uh, periodically, perhaps once a year or something like that. And so our planting is done in such a way so that we um, <clears throat> have space in between them and that we're able to allow maintenance to go in and remove the mulch in between the plants. And also that the plants be suitable for a location like that, which is not necessarily wet all the time. And which, um, uh, you know, so we have to pick plants that can take dry and wet and they're mostly ornamental. And then moving on to this um, topic with a slide, um, we also were looking at the importance of, for a park, <clears throat> the various aspects and good access, safe and comfortable visits, and some form of recreation needed. So we, uh, as Norman pointed out, the access was, was provided coming up through the trees and we were able to uh, save pretty much all the trees. I don't think there were any that were removed. And we, um, we had a, uh, um, well, the one sacrifice I guess with that was that we, we didn't maybe get as many spots, parking spots as we would like, but we were able to get the parking up in there and have drop offs. And so then <clears throat> for safe and comfortable, looking at this slide, uh, what I wanna point out is that uh, what we tried to emphasize here was that, and I think you know the uh, norm in his design as well, was that the side slopes on the pond, you know, we're not gonna require railings. Uh, so they're, I think, are they three to one or four to one in this case? Three to one, I think, right? And then, <clears throat> and then similarly with, um, um, the walls that we would, I mean, we of course need railings on those, but um, uh, as far as the comfort goes, it's just kind of having uh, human scale elements. And a uh, previous iteration of the design, the requirement would have, would have had this wall just be one big wall going all the way across. But uh, what we were able to do is break it into three parts and curve the walls, create more interest and in, in a more personable type of feeling to the to the uh, to the wall structures. Um, I'll, 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 let me just just jump in here. Yeah, Norm and I had a 20 foot high, 300 foot long wall. So so Jens definitely did us a favor here. <laughs> right. So um, let me see here. Um, next slide, please. So uh, Here's a good shot of the cells and also the, um, the concrete paving. The um, uh, park recreation is kind of an aspect to this as well. You know, what makes the park attractive to people? In this case, we knew that it wasn't going to be active recreation. It was going to be passive recreation, walking, uh, moving around the park, learning about the function of the park. And so some of the, the things we did were in order to enhance that. The concrete paving was, could have been gravel everywhere really, but the concrete paving is there to kind of enhance, create an entry experience, and also to kind of bring the visitor more into the park as they see the patterns repeated. And then as Norm was mentioning, it worked out pretty nice with the um, the head elevation and the manholes, they were actually maybe, you know, not quite 18 inches, but then bringing them to 18 inches, we were able to make them into seating elements and then also <clears throat> combine them with the paving pattern to, um, to focus attention on them. Next slide, please. So here you can see the view into the park and also worth mentioning here is that the, we did interpretive signage. Uh, the county um, had, uh, we were, were able to talk about the program and create some slides and we installed those. And so we're really telling the story. And I think it, you can think of it as coming full circle in a way, you know, you have the, uh, what, the ethical understanding of the community that we wanna save fish and wildlife and that we want clean drinking water <clears throat> and then this results in policies like Endangered Species Act 
and uh, ecology stormwater regulations. And then finally, Kitsap County policy about uh, embracing these uh, ideas and, and putting them into action. And now full circle, bringing the public out to educate and experience and further develop uh, an ethic of wanting to, to do more projects like this. So with that, I think um, I can wrap up and, and say thank you and uh, turn it back to Scott. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Great, uh, great presentation. We have a, a couple of questions here and not much time. So let's, uh, let's keep the uh, answers fairly brief here. One of the questions was from uh, Annie Alzheimer's, or I probably didn't do a good name on that, um, Alzheimer with Klein and Associates. What sort of modeling programs did you use to model this project? Yeah, the uh... Well, we have um, obviously WWHM 2012, and then we have some, uh, some flow modeling um, that uh, our engineers use routinely for, uh, for uh, modeling the control. And uh, so, but uh, we're, required, we're required to, by Department of Ecology, um, I don't know how many are outside of the state of Washington, but use, to use WWHM 2012 for modeling. Right. Um, another question here is the park. Uh, this is from Claudia Sterling. Is the park bicycle friendly? It is. Yes. Um, both in the, uh, the, 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 the compacted surface is, is firm and stable and uh, I'm a bicyclist. So it's uh, yes, it is. It is bicycle friendly. We didn't end up getting bike racks installed, but you know, they may choose to do so later on. Right. Uh, from Michelle, McGannis, probably didn't pronounce that correct. What kind of uh, operation and maintenance is expected for this project? Um, I'll just I'll just jump in. So I'm a project manager, so I don't really do the maintenance, but it's fantastic. I've done about a dozen projects for stormwater, and one thing I could rely on is that they are going to maintain them well. So the expectation for this is a minimum of a, a once per year mulch replacement, but it has actually been monitored the first several years because you really don't know until it's, it's gone through several cycles. And then they also have the, um, the plant maintenance, but uh, it, these, these specialty parks are more maintenance intensive. Right. Um, Annie uh, provided uh, some help on her name. It's uh, Alzheimer. Oh, I think I got that better. Um, from Claudia Sterling again, uh, love the bench concept. Is there a shade picnic area in the trees? There is. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, the trees. So uh, that it's uh, if if you pan further up uh, around the side, it's just Douglas fir land. And driving on uh, Highway Three, uh, you see rhododendrons blooming uh, prolifically along the highway uh, in this area. And so we planted a lot of um, uh, big leaf or, or uh, rhododendrons, native rhododendrons in the in the woods there. So it's going to be quite nice over time. Great. Um, I think this is our last question we have time for here. Uh, we do have other questions, so maybe we can get back to those if there's more time. But um, how many man hours to weed and upkeep? A lot. <laughs> Michelle? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I can get that figure for you, but I wouldn't want to guess at it at the moment. Yeah. That, that, that's a very good question. And, and uh, stormwater would have those numbers, but these parks do, my observation is they do require more than typical maintenance. And happily we have irrigation at the site. So that's going to, that's a big plus. In fact, while we were out there taking pictures last time, they were in there for their fall cleanup, uh, trimming all the grasses and doing that kind of thing. Right. Lesson learned from Manchester. Um, we really needed irrigation on pretty much everything. Right, the irrigation at this site though is based on a little well that uh, that was um, drilled. That was already on the site for the for the mobile home park. So. Oh, that's convenient. Um, yeah, we got lots of questions here, but um, I think uh, I'm gonna have to wrap it up here in the interest of staying on schedule, unless someone can tell me that we have more more time. So I'm gonna hand it back.
think I'm up next. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for um, congratulations on that project. That was very exciting. And um, based on the number of questions and inquiry, um, I hope that some of you guys are able to stick around for the networking session at the end of the, the day and can share some more thoughts about that project. Sounds really cool. And I look forward to visiting it one day. Um, our final session, well, not final session, excuse me, our um, final session of this uh, um, session or this this blurb is um, a little networking activity to get um, to get folks thinking about um, you know what's what's important to them. Um, David, did we have a slide ready for this? Thank you. So we're going to do just a, a thought share, and if you could put the, your responses in the chat window, and then you're going to get a little bit more time to take a little longer stretch break before the next session starts at 10:35. So if you type what, what is important to you about stormwater, and then we're going to um, assemble all these responses in basically a word cloud format that'll be part of our um, networking discussion later this morning as well. And we just kind of want to get an idea of um, where folks are, um, where their thoughts are with regard to stormwater. So put your responses in, do a little stretch break, um, you know, refill your coffee, use the restroom, whatever you need to do, but um, please um, come back then for the, the 1035 session. So thank you everyone for participating.